Hey guys, Perry here, and I'm back with another exclusive Collider video interview, and I'm really excited about this one. We have the director of Kubo and the Two Strings with us this time, Travis Knight. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. I got the chance to catch the movie last night, and yet again, like, has delivered something that is extra special, unique, and really stands out from just about everything out there. <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate that. So you are the CEO of Leica. Mm -hmm. You have produced Paranorman, and you produced The Box Trolls. Mm -hmm. This is your directorial debut. Why do that move on Kubo? Well, I've been working in animation for about 20 years now, and I've always wanted to creatively lead a project as a director on something, but I didn't want to take the job on until I felt like I was ready for on a number of different levels. I didn't. I wanted to make sure that I had enough experience, that I felt like I could do the job properly, but I also wanted to make sure that I had enough quote-unquote wisdom and perspective that I felt like I could bring something interesting to the narrative. Uh, you know, in the time that I've worked in in, in animation, I've been a, a great deal of thing, number of things. I've done, I've been a you know a PA, a scheduler, a coordinator, a stop motion, a CG animator. I've worked in development. I've been a producer. I've run a company. And I think it's only by virtue of having done all of those jobs that I was actually able to take on the job of being a director on this movie. Um, why I was drawn to this material, uh, you know, it comes back to a couple of things from from my childhood. I, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I was an enormous obsessive fan of big fantasy epics. I just, I absolutely devoured everything by C.S. Lewis and L. Frank Baum and Lewis Carroll. I love Greek and Norse mythology, but above all else, I adored J.R.R. Tolkien, as every right-thinking person does. And I think that's almost like a genetic thing because when my mother was pregnant with me and when she was recovering in the hospital the book that she was reading was Lord of the Rings. And so, like, from the moment I took my first breath, this was a, the, you know, a love of fantasy was something that she bestowed upon me. And then my dad, when I was around eight years old, my dad allowed me to tag along on one of his business trips to Japan. And I grew up in Portland, Oregon. And from the moment I set foot in Japan, it was really like I'd been transported to another world. It was so incredibly beautiful and breathtaking and almost otherworldly. And I just, I'd never experienced anything like it. And so, you know, this film is, is sort of the convergence of those two things, a lifelong love of fantasy that I got from my mom, a lifelong love for the transcendent art of Japan that I got from my dad, and then all bound together in a movie that's about family. And it's, it's, a, it's a movie that's about family that's inspired by family, and that's what really resonated with me. And what's the pitch process like at Leica? Because I've been to some uh, Pixar set visits, so they've broken down that process where it's like they pitch three things and then they whittle it down and then they pick one. Do you guys have a similar thing where no. a certain time of year? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't have anything that regimented. Uh, we uh, were a pretty sloppy organization, I suppose, when I hear it put it that way. Uh, no, I mean, we look everywhere. We look all over the world for the best stories we can find. And sometimes they're adaptations of literature. Sometimes they're things that we develop in-house, like we did with, with Kubo. Uh, pr pretty much wherever it happens to be, you know, there's only a handful of things that we take on. We only take those things on and develop those things that we really, truly love, that we really want to see on the screen. And the basic criteria is that, you know, we want to make movies that matter. We want to make movies that are bold, that are distinctive, that are enduring. They're not little pop culture confections that actually have something interesting to say, that are meaningful and thought provoking um, and hopefully explore different genres different worlds and different aspects of what it means to be human absolutely I, you guys definitely do that on box trolls too because when that when that marketing campaign first started it's like oh cute creatures but when you actually sit back and watch that movie there's so much more to it that makes you think and it's the same exact thing here especially with with Kubo's Kubo's journey and the supernatural component like what I love that you guys do here is that He's got all these powers, but you don't necessarily have to explain them all. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me about testing that element of this with an audience, especially when you're going for kids and adults? How do you figure out how much in terms of rules to explain about his abilities? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, we don't test anything. We never focus group anything, which is crazy in this modern age that we live in. And I think that that's it gets to maybe what's a little bit unusual about Leica and maybe a little stupid about Leica is that our films really are, they rep, when you see our films, they represent a purity of filmmaking. It's, it's absolutely the vision of the director and the creative team behind it. What you're seeing is the story that they believed in, the, the story they wanted to tell and the film they wanted to make. Um, I, I, I can appreciate in this modern era, it makes sense to do you know test screenings and focus groups and that sort of thing, but that's just not how we operate. And so, um, you know, I, I think what you, what you see is, is a really a, an, un, an unvarnished, you know, vision of, of what the story needs to be. Now, in, in terms of how much you explain in the rules, it can be, uh, uh, you know, a delicate, you know, balancing act, a little dance that you end up doing because, you know, we, we have this fantastic world 
Um, there's a lot of intricate things that are happening. Uh, how much do you explain? How much do you leave to the audience to just just intuit? Um, you know, that's something that you that you kind of you, you straddle that line all the way through as you're developing the story. Um, but I think the main thing is for us is that we really respect the audience's intelligence. We do not pander to our audience. We can appreciate that kids and families are smart and sophisticated. They can handle things. Uh, we don't need to speak down to them. And I think that that's, those are the kinds of films that I love growing up. Those are the kind of stories I love reading when I was a kid. And those are the kinds of films that we want to make. We, we don't believe in dumbing things down and watering things down. And we think that through the prism of fantasy and animation, you know, something that's an abstraction from reality, you can actually explore a lot of interesting, meaningful things that are, that are you know, because it's removed from real life, it actually, you know, it takes the sting out of it a little bit. It makes it a little more poetic and makes it digestible and understandable for a young audience. And how about in terms of your animation technique? Is there anything about Kubo that would have made it a film that you would have had to have made after movies like Box Trolls and Paranorman? Oh, undoubtedly, yeah. I mean, this is by far the most ambitious thing that we've ever taken on. It, you know, we at the beginning we started talking about it as a stop motion David Lean film, a big you know monumental Kurosawa myth, but in miniature. And because that's the way we shoot these things, it's you know we have a crummy warehouse in Portland, Oregon, and we shoot things on a tabletop that we gussy up to make it look like it's a real place. But it's a small scale movie, and it needed to feel because of what it was an epic. It needed to feel like a you know a large sweeping you know epic, and so that means you know using a lot of different techniques that we developed over the years to make that happen. At the beginning of the process, we had no idea how we were going to do half of this stuff. Um, but from Coraline on, the ten years that Laika has been in existence. We've kept the core creative team together. We've kept the band together, which is really unusual in this industry for a team to be together that long. And what it's allowed us to do is with each successive film, we build on the artistic and the technological innovations that happen over the course of making the film that we can then apply that learning to the next film. And so it's only by virtue of the fact that we made Coraline and Par Paranorman and Box Trolls that we built up the skill set, the technological and artistic skill set to make a movie of this scale. And we couldn't have done this. We couldn't have even imagined doing this film, uh, you know, a a handful of years ago. Are there any hidden Easter eggs from your previous films or maybe even influences? Because when I looked at the sisters in this one, my mind immediately went to the other mother. <laughs> uh, we do have, seem to have a fixation with eyes for some reason. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I'd say so. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the sisters are terrifying. They're, uh, I mean, that's like white knuckle bowel loosening terror right there. Uh, that, you know, we, when we, when we introduce the sisters, that's, you know, that's, we're in full on horror movie mode. But, you know, the, they're in this particular film, there's not really any nods to previous things that we've done. Uh, you know, sometimes we hide things within it and we kind of weave other things that we've, we've done previously. This specific film, because it was so far removed that from anything else that we've done, it needed to live in its own world. And so there really isn't any, any hints or nods or gestures that kind of reference other films that we've done. Even though I've been researching this film and keeping up with the promotional campaign before it's come out, I was really surprised last night when it was revealing the voice actors behind the characters mm -hmm. and the sisters was Rooney Mara. Yeah. I don't know why, but that was very surprising to me. I didn't hear her in that right. role at all. So can you tell me a little bit about filling the voice roster here? Because on the one hand, yeah, it's great to have a name like Matthew McConaughey on your film so it gets out there to an mm -hmm. audience who might not find it otherwise, but right. at the same time, you don't want an A-list actor to overshadow the character. Well, I think that's entirely true uh, you know when you're casting for animation the process is you know you really want to find the most powerful voice that you can and and when you arrange them uh, the voices together it's it's kind of like an orchestra you want each thing to kind of occupy its own unique space within the sonic spectrum and so you need someone who's got a beautiful voice someone who has a, a, a rich and evocative voice who can get the full range of human emotion using just their voice you know in a, in a live-action film an actor can communicate so much without uttering a word but in animation, that doesn't do us any good. That needs that emotion needs to come out of the voice, and then the animator handles the physical side of the acting. Um, and so, for us, the way we cast our films is that we listen to films that actors have done in the past, you know, dramatic roles, and we pull audio clips independent of what they look like. We don't even listen to that. We put that up next to a design of the character. So we pull clips from movies they've done. We pull clips from interviews they've done to hear how their voice naturally sounds, and then we we, we start to evaluate: Does this sound right for this character? Uh, but you're you're absolutely right. You don't want something you don't want a voice to pull you out of the movie. I mean, we're creating this world, and if a voice is so recognizable that it starts to make you think about something else, then you're pulled out of the narrative. And I think it's, it's a credit to every single actor in the film that they completely embraced what this was, they dove into it, 
you know, com- you know, with with complete abandon and committed to these roles. And I don't. I think by and large, you can't. You don't. You don't know who these characters, these actors are. I think when you see their names at the at the end of the film, had you not known it from promotions, you probably wouldn't know who these actors were. But they all give ex- astounding performances. The way you end the movie, like I want to just say, don't walk out of the movie after it's over. You want to stay for the end credits because not only is the animation in the end credits great, there's a great song, and it's just a really fun feeling to have the reveal of who's voicing the actors, but. In the end, we get to see the scale of some of your bigger set pieces in the movie. Mm. But can you talk about any teeny tiny details that are especially difficult to animate that people might not think about? Like, I look at this and I look like, oh, like hair rustling in the wind or even yeah. smoke, things like that. Uh, everything's hard. <laughs> there's, there's nothing that comes easy in stop motion. It's all hard. Um, I think most people understand that the the spectacle is difficult. You know, if you're working in stop motion, you're animating on tabletops to try to make something look like, you know, it's a big action sequence. It's a big fight that's taking place on a raging storm at sea or that our characters are, are battling against a giant 100-foot monster, that that's hard to do. And it is. In fact, we have you know these massive mythological creatures that we have in this movie, which was really a nod to Ray Harryhausen, which is, a you know, an artist that I've loved since I was a kid. And in fact... Harryhausen is probably the main reason why I got involved in stop motion to begin with. And so we have these these great monsters, the first of which is this giant skeleton, which of course is a nod to Harryhausen's uh, Jason and the Argonauts, where Jason, a live action Jason, you know, stands off against these uh, this army of skeleton warriors made uh, brought to life through stop motion. In our case, it's a you know it's a massive puppet. It's the biggest puppet that we've ever made. You know, fully assembled. It's 16 feet tall. It uh, it's got a wingspan from from tip to tip of 23 feet. It weighs 400 pounds. It was just this enormous thing, and uh, you know the way we had to keep it stabilized is we had we built a bit a big metal rig that's underneath the torso. That it, it, it's effectively the same kind of technology you use in a flight simulator or in you know a, a theme park ride, a virtual reality theme park ride, and that was a way that we can keep it stabilized and controlled uh, without it toppling over and pureeing the animator, which is something you don't want. Um, so that was challenging. But then I think the the other thing, as you were mentioning, you know, these moments of 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 closeness, of intimacy, of these characters connecting and really you know showcasing their emotion and and being human and revealing themselves and being vulnerable. When you're when you're animating a you know a puppet that's you know nine and a half inches tall, and you know you got these big disgusting greasy sausage fingers, and you're trying to you know make tiny little minute motions of these characters, including you know the hair and the breathing and the heaving in the chest and everything else, to make them feel fully alive, that's just as difficult to do as the spectacle. And so I think it's on both ends of the spectrum that we really threw ourselves into this thing, and I think it's why these things feel fully alive. Absolutely. Now before we have to wrap up, I want to touch on box office because I am clearly a huge fan of your work your company's work but you know when you have heavy hitters like Pixar and Disney animation out there I look at the box office numbers for their movies and it's like oh my god right. I don't want to presume to know whether your films are financially successful or not but I look at those and it it, it upsets me every time <laughs> that a like a movie comes out that regardless of whether or not that opening weekend is big for you guys mm-hmm. I want it to be bigger I want it to be on the scale of those other companies so from your perspective is that something you guys are concerned about is that something that you're thinking of moving forward yeah, I mean, it's always a consideration. I mean, just taking it back from the financial side for a second, I mean, even as an artist, as a storyteller, I mean, you want the things that you do. You don't want it to just sit on some shelf in some lonely corner of an art museum. You want people to experience it. You want people to see it. You want to share your art with, with the world. Uh, and so we want it to be ex- these stories to be experienced by as many people as possible. Uh, you know, certainly from a business perspective, you want these films to do well because the more people go see our movies, the better our films do, the more movies we can make. And so there absolutely is a, is a financial incentive there for these films to do well. Um, you know, I think that, that we recognize that we are an independent animation house and that we tell more challenging stories, riskier stories. And by virtue of that, your threshold for success, you know, is, is probably going to be lower and by virtue of that you've got to make sure that your budgets are as lean as possible which is so we're very very disciplined in how we approach our movies you know our 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 budgets are a fraction of the uh, of the budgets of you know a big disney or pixar film uh, but even still of course we want our films to do well we want people to see these movies uh you know i've been pleased by the performance of the film uh to this point but i'm never satisfied i want them to you know i want them to everybody in the world to see these things oh, i feel <laughs> yeah on that note i want to say go see kubo and the two strings on August 19th and if you haven't seen like his other work Coraline Paranorman Box Trolls please go check it out 
Travis, congratulations on the movie. Your directorial debut. This is quite the achievement. Fantastic film. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you. It was my pleasure. So again, Kubo and the Two Strings, August 19th. Go check it out. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.